So, um, by way of introducing the key point of my talk, which will be about this idea of non-human photography that I've been working with for a long time, I wanted to show you a film clip. And the film will, that will play in the background. So what happened there is that at the beginning of the 21st century, a professional photographer with an interest in environmental issues called James Ballag decided to record Glacier Retreat which is a phenomenon that is considered the most visible indicator of climate change in the world today. To realize his project, Balog invested in a number of Nikon DSLR cameras, which he then customized with microcomputers in order to enable them to capture images over a period of several years in different weather conditions. The cameras were then installed in high resistance cases and soldered onto rocks. Exposed to extremely harsh weather conditions that you can see in Iceland, Alaska, and the Arctic, these cameras recorded for years on end the transformation of the geo and hydrosphere. On retrieving the cameras, Balog uploaded the data onto his computer and then edited the still images into time-lapsed videos that illustrated the progressive ice loss from glaciers subsequently developed into the award-winning documentary called Chasing Ice, the project has been promoted worldwide via a series of events under the umbrella of the Anthropocene, which is the present time interval going back to at least the times of the Industrial Revolution, in which the human has been recognized as a geological agent who's had irreversible impact upon the world. Now, Balog's film encapsulates all the key issues I'm concerned with in my work uh, around this idea of non-human photography, which is also the title of the, the recent book that Melanie mentioned. So on the one hand, the production process involved in shooting the multi-year collection of those images of glaciers from high vantage points in extreme weather conditions signals that today, in the age of CCTV, drone media, photogrammetry and satellite imaging, photography is increasingly decoupled from human agency and human vision. Yet for me, even those images that are produced by the human, be they artist or amateur, entail a non-human mechanical element. So I mean that by this, I mean that they involve the execution of technical and cultural algorithms that shape our image making devices as well as our viewing practices. So on the one hand, the story about the Glacier Project demonstrates how photography is increasingly mobilized to document the precariousness of our habitat. And also that through advertising, campaigns, Instagram, it's tasked with helping us imagine a better tomorrow and a better life for ourselves. Now I'm quite suspicious of those images like the polar bear on the you know, melting ice and a bit of you know, Amazon collapsing. I think people see them and then you know, it's supposed to lead to behavioral change and nothing really happens. But from this, I'm developing this proposition that in its conjoined human non-human agency and vision, photography functions as both a form of control today and the life-shaping force. So that's basically my argument, that photography both controls us and that photography makes us, makes our life a certain way, does something for us. It's both restrictive and creative. Uh, all encompassing in the workings of traffic control cameras, smartphones and Google Earth, photography can be described as a technology of life. It's not only represents life, but also shapes and regulates life, while also documenting, documenting or even envisaging its demise. Now, thanks to the proliferation of digital and portable media, as well as broadband connectivity, photography has become, of course, pervasive and ubiquitous today. We could go so far as to say, say that our very sense of existence is shaped by it. In the words of Susan Sontag, to live is to be photographed. But this altered or enhanced role of agent and agency of the photographic medium calls for a new understanding of photography, I suggest, beyond its traditional humanist frameworks and perceptions. 
So the notion of non-human photography analyzes this new ontological and political conjuncture, as well as possible ways of negotiating it, while also refusing to submit to the conventional human versus machine narrative. And there are good reasons why a new framework for understanding photography as part of wider media context may be needed. But even though photography has become embedded in our everyday lives on so many levels, the traditional academic and curatorial ways of discussing the photographic medium still maintain a relatively narrow set of human-centric frameworks and discourses on the topic, where photography is seen either as art, something you know, undertaken by people called artists, and exhibited in galleries, magazines, or on, on billboards, or it's seen as social practice, something done by amateurs, by people with phones these days. But my project of non-human photography adopts a different framework, that of post-humanist media theory. By this, I mean a media theoretical framework that combines insights from media and cultural studies, as well as philosophy, while also raising questions about the human subject as the anchor and main reference point of analysis. In other words, I see photography first and foremost as a medium, one that is subject to dynamic and ongoing processes of mediation, only some of which involve humans. Now, as a serious practitioner, I also incorporate various photographic projects into my written work by way of enacting different modes of thinking about and with media, one that involves the simultaneous production of media. So my argument is meant to be both affirmative and critical. In analyzing non-human photography as a cultural condition in which visual enhancement, algorithmic logic, and mediated perception enable different modes of visuality and self-identification, I also raise ethical political questions about the camera eyes inhumane or even anti-human interventions. My notion of non-human photography encapsulates three interconnected planes. So the term for me refers to the rather frequently encountered yet often uncanny looking photographs that not, are not of the human. For example, you know, expansive landscapes without people. But uh, it also refers to photographs that are not by the human. So contemporary high-tech images produced by, you know, Google Street View, traffic control cameras, uh, but also outcomes of deep time impressioning processes such as fossils. Now it might seem a bit weird to think of fossils as photographs, but maybe it's not that weird. We'll come back to this point later on. So park it for now, if it seems too strange. So we've got the two ideas so far, non-human photography photographs, not of the human and not by the human. And now this is the strangest one. The third one is photographs that are not for the human from QR codes and other algorithmic modes of machine communication that rely on photographic technology through perhaps still rather cryptic sounding photography after the human. So photography for a different species, species that comes after us perhaps. Now the link between photography and the Anthropocene, so this current geological epoch, which basically is about human messing up the world, the planet, and more broadly between photography, biology and geology, highlights the interweaving of the matter and materiality of chemistry, minerals, fossil fuels and the sun, but also of us humans with this particular medium. In the introduction to the book, The Non-Human Turn, Richard Grusin identifies this eponymous turn with the decentering of the human as the datum point of the humanities, and with a shift of attention towards questions concerning our human engagement, as well as material entanglement with non-human entities and issues, from climate change, he writes, drought and famine, to biology, intellectual property and privacy, to genocide, terrorism and war. Now, in a similar vein, Elizabeth Ellsworth and Jamie Cruz have recently postulated something called the geological turn. And by this, they mean an increasingly widespread turn towards the geologic as a source of explanation and inspiration 
for cultural responses to conditions of the present moment. All these authors intimate that the recognition of the vital role played by non-human agents in the life of our planetary system, in the life of our planetary system, needs to shape our understanding of the radical changes brought on by the modern way of life. So what are these changes? Well, obviously, kind of the environment is now in the air, literally, as Elizabeth Colbert has explained in this by now a famous article in the National Geographic titled Enter the Anthropocene, Age of Man. Probably the most significant change from a geological perspective is one that is invisible to us. The change in the composition of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide emissions are colorless, odorless, and in an immediate sense, harmless. But their warming effects could easily push global temperatures to levels that haven't been seen for millions of years. We could therefore say that there is something in the air at the moment. And this something is a mixture of cosmic dust and human-induced pollution. In other words, the Anthropocene describes the changing condition of photography and photomedia because it becomes visible to us through altered light and through the particulate matter that is reflected in it. But the Anthropocene also serves as an articulator of a new crisis, a crisis of life itself both as a biological and social phenomenon. Now, one of the main reasons I propose to link the light of photography and the shadow of the Anthropocene is that as the receding glacier story I presented to you at the outset demonstrates, many responses to the planetary crisis signaled uh, by that latter term have been visual. As well as science-led projects such as the one by Balog, we can also mention large-scale art photographs of the damaged environment by Andreas Gursky or Edward Bortinsky. And I aim to explain this representationalist approach to suggest that the concept of non-human photography can also help us see and understand in a new way both the photographic medium and ourselves as being constituted by this medium. So my claim about photography's vital importance in the age of the global crisis of life at various levels constitutes the project's philosophical axis. And as, as I said earlier, I claim that photography is a formative practice of life, not only because it represents our lives in various ways, although it does, but also because it actually shapes life. It does this through images, but also through all sorts of material impressions it activates and also through the forms of perception it generates. In a philosophical gesture, which is similar to the one made by Siegfried Zielinski in Deep Time of the Media, my argument here expands the notion of photography beyond things that humans do with cameras or phones to embrace imaging processes from which the human is absent. Microphotography, space photography, drone mounted cameras, CCTV. Yet by way of a conceptual experiment, I also want to take a step further to read human cultural practices as only one section of longer term processes occurring across nature cultures. And this will allow us to see photography as occurring precisely across what Zielinski calls deep time, as forms of stabilized perception and impression that occur across various media, stone, clay, wax, or even skin and tanning, and to consider photographs in terms of fossils. The recognition of the formative role of light across different time periods in fossils and imprints and photograms, analog film frames, digital snapshots, will also help us shift the debate on photography beyond the analog digital binary. And it's this moment of, uh, of the temporary stabilization which signals a cut in time that differentiates photography from moving media, such as film or video for me. And that in spite of its kinship with other media points to photography's ontological singularity. So there is something special about photography I'm claiming. And there are some interesting predecessors to this non-human mode of thinking in media and communications disciplines where, you know, on which current photography theory draws. 
In the work of Canadian scholar Harold Innes, for example, railroads and trade routes were, are being read as part of the wider communication system. We could also look to Welshman Raymond Williams's linking of culture to cultivation. That is the transformation of substance um, uh, at the biological level, beyond the control or even influence of the human. Then we've got the book, The Marvelous Clouds by John Darren Peters, where he says that media theory is about environments and infrastructures as much about messages and content. And then we need to think of media as environmental. But we need also to ask why it makes sense for us embodied humans today to zoom in on the sliver of geological unfolding we call history to try to make sense of it using the, the conceptual tools and material tools at our disposal. So with this, I want to recalibrate the human in relation to geological scales and to see ourselves reduced in size and importance. And there are good ethical reasons for doing that. So I'm interested in the kind of seeing and unseeing things we take for granted. And this notion of non-human vision that shapes this project uh, offers an alternative vantage point from which we could see and understand ourselves as humans and you know what we humans call the world with all its non-human entanglements. So I wanted to show you a visual project of mine that can show this kind of different way of looking and seeing. It's called I Earth, and it offers a view of natural spaces that are actually woman-made while also bearing an imprint of a technological tool. Manufactured from a children's diorama kit, these are natural landscapes dazzle with color and lushness, displaying the kind of greenery that is more associated with media representations of nature than with nature itself. The bird's eye view of the landscapes evokes the perspective of satellite images of different locations, which we associate, for example, with Google Earth or Microsoft's virtual Earth now. This particular perspective has a double function. It denaturalizes what we know, while also creating an illusion of immediacy, proximity, and visual mastery. The now you see it, now you don't aspect introduced by pixelation and, and GIF animation, coupled with what may look like excessive acceleration or even computer error, is aimed to push the viewer to engage with these images physically through squinted eyes. The aesthetics of the iEarth project issues an injunction. The viewer has to become actively involved in the process of seeing by moving her head, blinking, or even looking away, just thinking, please stop this terrible thing flashing in front of my eyes. Uh, and the kind of creating a pseudo sublime that we often associated, uh, associate with the frustrating and jaggy visuality of the early internet. The homono homonymy between the eye and eye and eye earth it's also a commentary on our practices of looking at the world, but also on our narcissism when engaging with it. This brand-like title is to remind us that nature has become a commodity, a product we fetishize and yearn for. So the idea is that, you know, we're kind of trying to look at the earth through a different angle. And this project has a kind of, um, is in conversation, with um, you know, attempts to see our planet historically uh, from different viewpoints, which is also, and from especially planetary viewpoints. Uh, and this has arguably led to enable the development of what we today call globalization. And I want you to you know, show these two images that many people probably know. They're quite iconic. Um, 1968 Earthrise and 72 Blue Marble. Canadian theorist Chris Russell explains how they were used by Stuart Brand in his whole Earth catalog, the kind of Californian magazine, counterculture magazine, to show a particular image of both our present and future. He used these images to create a collective vision of humanity, while also allowing humans to see themselves from outside a vision which was intended to evoke a sense of responsibility and make humans want to care for this, you know, little a jewel in space. So suddenly humans had a planet to tend to. And, but also there is something suspicious here. And for me, uh, 
emerging, producing what I want to call, with the help from Donna Haraway, a view from nowhere. It's interestingly, not a single uh, astronaut on Apollo 17 from whom the, um, the image originated did actually see the Earth as depicted in the blue marble image, as they were unable to position their bodies close enough to the window. They were really shooting from the hip, and then they were all fighting who was actually the author of that minute image. More interestingly, they all, um, there was also a lot of technical manipulation involved in the production of these two photographs. You know, obviously the raw data was sent from, you know, from the space cameras to image processors at NASA. The labs adjusted and reoriented the copies and they chose the color scheme to align with cultural expectations of what heaven should look like. So while the evenly lit earth in the blue marble is the result of the adjustment of light and shadows, Earthrise, as we know it, has been shifted from a portrait to a landscape orientation to create an illusion of the Earth rising over the moon with a view to subjugating the non-human eye of the space camera to the visual mastery of the human. So the rationale behind these manipulations was to repress, according to Chris Russell, the strangeness and difficulty in seeing the Earth. But the strangeness we act, you know, also experienced recently was seeing photographs of the black hole. And there was a kind of per perceptual shift occurring that was supposed to promote the environmental agenda to get us to see the planet in all its kind of glory, but also fragility. Um, so, you know, and it's very difficult, of course, we know, to represent climate change. You can have all sorts of diagrams. You can have, you know, showing the rise in world temperatures, rise in sea ocean levels. But to actually see the planet suffering, it's very difficult. You don't quite know what you're supposed to be looking at. You would need to look at things over a really long time. So this was like a certain ploy to show the planet as a graspable object, something that we have to look after, but that can also be uh, taken away from us. So photography as philosophy um, uh, as, uh, and becomes for me a way of thinking about images, but also making images and image-based projects to kind of ask questions that, you know, you can get there quicker sometimes with an image-based project than with words. Although I'm not trying to, to uh, castigate words because, you know, writing, theorizing is important to me as well. But my, my project is I Earth, the flashing project and its more serious visual predecessors are not meant to serve as direct illustrations of the concept of non-human photography I'm presenting, but they do lead us to a wider problematic of human non-human relations, raising the political ethical questions about our human responsibility in the world for the world in which agency of the majority of act actors wind, meteorite, virus, goes beyond that of human decision and will. So the question of human responsibility in the universe, which is you know, fully entangled on both a cellular and cosmic level, is an important one. Even if we can't be really sure what this fragile human we stands for, the responsibility to face and give an account for the unfoldings of this world, which is made up of human and non-human entities, belongs to us humans in a singular way. And to explain what I mean by this, let me show you another project. In the summer of 2016, uh, let me just sorry, play this. In the summer of 2016, a news item caught my eye, reporting the discovery of an extensive pre-industrial urban settlement in Cambodia that exceeded the familiar boundaries of the Angkor Wat temple complex. By firing lasers to the ground from a helicopter, Archaeologists ended up producing extremely detailed imagery of the Earth's surface while revealing a highly sophisticated water management system at work in the Angkor Wat Empire. So the report was of interest to me, not only because the discovery of the hidden imagistic and material layer underneath the Cambodian jungle was accomplished by the mobilization of techniques and methods of non-human photography, but also it offered an actual message from the end of the world, a trace of a civilization long gone, whose presence revealed itself to the non-human vision of an airborne laser scanner. With a human eye, 
both in its flat and elevated positions, could only see vegetation, the so-called LIDAR survey eye, where LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging, was able to penetrate through the surface to identify the geometric patterns of earth mounds that archaeologists could then read as the early Khmer society's urban infrastructure. The ability of laser imaging technology to penetrate through thick jungle and uncover traces of past societies allowed archaeologists to revisit their prior theories about the rise and decline of civilizations while revealing long-term patterns of human environment interactions at the regional scale. High resolution airborne laser scanning is capable of showing that the extent of human made changes or human driven changes to natural landscapes during the past few thousand years has so far been substantially underestimated. So the technology involved in doing all of this is kind of interesting as well. It's a combination of various photomedia devices, you know, this airborne laser scanner, digital camera, which was a 60 megapixel Leica, as well as sophisticated modeling software used in post-production to interpret the data. The scanner mounted to a helicopter skid pad pulsed the terrain at regular intervals during flight. So non-human photography is therefore very much dependent on the human element. Engineers, photographers, pilots, coders, archaeologists, data, data scientists. This human non-human assemblage has permeated and shaped photography since its very beginning, actually, as evidenced in examples such as fossils, again, seen by photographer and geologist William Jerome Harrison as early photographs, or in this famous photo of Lake Oak Abbey, about which its owner, Fox Talbot, said that it was the first building that was ever yet known to have drawn its own picture. But this human-non-human -human coupling is foregrounded much more explicitly in those kinds of high-resolution, software-driven photomediations. So I'm saying that photography has always been a non-human, that's been this non-human trace and understanding as well about the non-human forces in the framing of the medium since early days. And yet some kind of intensification has obviously happened with the computational turn. And we've got, you know, the development of this new field called photogrammetry, you know, making images from measurements has also accompanied that new development with things that look like photographs in the project, for example, you know, this person does not exist. And, you know, in images created from just you know, measures taken from the ground. So um, that is kind of, we could ask a question, is it still photography or have we arrived at something that's called post photography? And the concept of post photography has recently become quite popular in an attempt to capture that shift in the medium in the age of internet and mobile phone. There is this catalog book published on the occasion of the post photography exhibition at Rencontre d'Arles in 2013, or the 2014 photo book, Post Photography, the artist with the camera. So people who work with photographs or on photographs include photographs, but don't take them, like Robert Shaw, who's gathered a work of 50, people, 50 artists doing just that. So these artists of in Shaw's book are rather meta photographers who can make sense of the billions of images being made. But rather than follow any such linear shift from photography to post photography, I'm more inclined to side with Edgar Gomez Cruz, who while remaining aware of the changes, favors the expansion of the definition of photography and not its overcoming. So he wants to kind of, he, to still continue using the term photography, provided we are prepared to challenge the limiting representationalist or indexical, as we call it, understanding of photography, and focus instead on its creative interfacial role in both making marks and establishing connections, knowing that maybe connections between images are as important or more important than images themselves. So the rethinking of photography in algorithmic and computational terms today invites us to see the photographic image as first of all a node in the network sequence of human non-human processes of connection, translation and invention. But if we are prepared to accept that photography since its early days has been inventive, 
For example, we can see it in, the, in its black and white legacy that entailed a process of creative translation in the early days, and that it's been non-human since early days, was the first image in the history of photography, Niepce's Le Gras, having taken eight hours to be made, and therefore presenting a distinctly non-human vision and non-human agency as evidence in shadows on both sides of the image. Uh, so if we accept the photography has been non-human and it's been um, had this non-human vision, then the current developments merely foreground this original entanglement and kinship with non-human forces. Entanglement we see in fossils, analog snapshots, and these LIDAR produced photo measurements and photo maps. The algorithm computer and network-based photography merely intensifies this condition, while also opening up some new questions and possibilities. So the possibility of seeing into the past and into the future of seeing life before and after the human, but also before and after non-human counterparts, glaciers, empires, is also an instance when non-human visuality turns into a human-centric responsibility. As a practice of the cut, photography can help us redistribute and resize the human sensible to see other traces, connections, and affordances and to let us humans perceive and experience the world otherwise. Non-human photography can allow us to unsee ourselves from our own parochial, human-centered anchoring and encourage a different vision of the world. And uh, we don't need to really... Um, anyway, sorry, I'm just skipping this. And I'm thinking I'll probably stop here, but before I do that, I wanted to show you as a postscript uh, my own project called... Uh, active perceptual vision. And for this project and explain how I try to kind of uh, enact some of this while, while writing this book on non-human photography. So there are the images that make up the project were taken over a period of two years with an automated intelligent wearable camera called the autographer. The cameras were originally designed for, as a mnemonic device for Alzheimer's patients, but then it was remarketed as a media gadget for the always on generation. On selected days between 2014 and 2016, I wore the camera in various everyday situations, on a city walk, in a holiday resort, in an art gallery, in a lecture theater, at, even at home. The camera was really small, it looked like a necklace, and yet people could see I was wearing something, but it randomly captured photographs at frequent intervals, which I then uploaded to my computer. My decision to wear it on a given day, switch it on and select and process images, was coupled with the decision of the camera algorithm regarding what to photograph and when. The machining behavior was nevertheless influenced by the way I moved my body, enacting a form of immersive, corporeal perception that broke with the representationalist linearity of the perspective, while also retaining human involvement in multiple acts of image capture. So the human element was also foregrounded in the editing process. I mean, I ended up with 18,000 images from which I chose several dozen. The selection process was akin to making careful incisions in the image flow, with a view to setting up narrative connections. So in an age of constant surveillance from CCTV installed in city centers and public transport and shopping malls, through to self-monitoring via constant recording of our lives with cell phones or, or even on Zoom, active perceptual systems is designed as a commentary on this constant fabrication of images of us, but also by us. It also raises the question whether in the age of what Willem Flusser called image obesity, the fact that there are, you know, there's so many images today, he calls image obesity, the creative photographer can first be first and foremost be seen as an editor, a Flusseria informer who provides structure to the imagistic flow after the images have been taken. 
And so you can see kind of some more of material uh, under the you know address www.nonhuman.photography. There's a museum of non-human photography there with some images. And there is also a follow-up film that deals with some of the images that are made as part of another project. Uh, it's Exit Man and it's freely available on one of my websites. So.